Hello and welcome for today's webinar. Just want to give a quick moment to some upcoming courses that we have. On May 20th, we've partnered with the New York, New Jersey Occupational Safety and Health Center to offer a free webinar, Organization of Work Factors Associated with Workability Among Aging Nurses, as a part of our NIOSH ERC ergonomics webinar series. On June 3rd, we'll be joined by Suzanne Turan from UC Berkeley's Labor and Occupational Health Program, Kevin Riley from UCLA's Labor Occupational Safety and Health Program, and Teresa Andrews from UC Davis Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety for a free webinar on protecting California workers from wildfire smoke. Our next NIOSH ERC Industrial Hygiene Webinar will be on June 9th with Dr. Elizabeth Knopf and Dr. Kathy Hammond on Exposure Assessment for Epidemiology Research, Use of Routine Industrial Monitoring Data. For more about these upcoming events, you can visit coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And on behalf of the NIOSH supported education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the 2020 Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series, offering free webinars the second Tuesday of each month. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar, Indoor Air Quality in Net Zero Energy Schools, is brought to you by the Central Appalachian Regional Education and Research Center and Dr. Clint Pinion. A few housekeeping items first. You'll be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A. We will save time at the end of this presentation to address all questions. As a reminder, participants who have logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive a link to the recording and an evaluation form that will qualify participants for certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Once you complete this online evaluation, you'll be able to access your certificate. This email will come to you tomorrow, at roughly the same time tomorrow around noon. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the COEH Northern California's YouTube page and on our website. At this time, we're pleased to welcome our presenter. Dr. Clint Pinion is Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental Health Science and Director of the Master of Public Health Program at Eastern Kentucky University. He spent six years as a health, safety, and environmental professional in the oil and gas industry in the Houston area, serving in roles such as the Global Health, Safety, and Environmental Education and Training Manager, and Environmental Technician for a Global Engineering, Procurement, Fabrication, and Construction Company. He currently serves as a consultant for an environmental and occupational health consulting group based in Lexington, Kentucky. Dr. Pinion earned his Doctor of Public Health degree in Environmental and Occupational Health Science from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, UT Health, School of Public Health. He also earned a Master's of Public Health degree and Master's of Arts in Higher Education from Eastern Kentucky University and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biology from Berea College. He currently serves as president of the American Industrial Hygiene Association, Kentuckiana section, past president of the Association of Environmental Health Academic Programs, and president-elect of Kentucky Environmental Health Association. Dr. Pinion is a registered sanitarian in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and a certified industrial instructional trainer through the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. He received the EKU Creative and Critical Thinking Teacher of the Year Award in 2017 and 2019. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pinion. Ah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for everyone for joining today. Um, this presentation will be based on a consulting gig, if you will, that one of my colleagues and I um, completed in the Midwestern portion of the United States. And before I begin, I just wanted to give a disclaimer that I have no conflict of interest to disclose to you. Now, many of you um, may already know what we're going to go over in terms of the content, but hopefully you'll take away something new today. Um, the learning outcomes for you, though, just in case you missed it on the flyer, is to list common indoor air pollutants, discuss the indoor air quality assessment process, and discuss possible mitigation methods for indoor air quality issues. 
So, um, as many of you probably have experienced in your careers as a consultant, as an academic, folks come to you when they see that you work in environmental and occupational health with you know, very strange and then sometimes very mundane um, issues. So a colleague and I were contacted by a school in the Midwestern portion of the United States and they had teachers that complained about being sick. And the teachers believed that the sickness they were experiencing was associated with poor indoor air quality at their work. Now, just for a few points of emphasis, this school had undergone several IAQ studies in the past and all the readings would come back normal, but the teachers would still have the same complaints. They were drowsy, they were experiencing headaches, uh, stuffy nose, irritated throat, many of the um, symptoms that you would associate with IEQ, but also many of the same symptoms you would associate with the common cold. So a little background about this school. Um, they are a net zero energy school, which means essentially that they will not take more from the grid than they actually can put back. So if you think about it, when you have a zero net energy consumption school, the total amount of energy used by that building on an annual basis is equal to the amount of renewable energy that's created on that site. And so this school was established in 2011 and really the whole focus of the design was that it was gonna be energy and environmentally efficient. Um, it, it has spacious classrooms with lots of labs. It has an equine program, it has a uh, diesel engine program that's all geared towards agriculture. Uh, they have their own aquaculture area for raising fish. They have a huge auditorium for selling livestock. It's basically a dream school for anyone that's involved in agriculture. It's also a magnet school, meaning that students do not spend the entire day there, but of course the teachers do. This particular school uses solar panels. It has a um, waste disposal through its constructed wetlands. It has rainwater collection systems that are built into the school building, but also built into the barns and the arena. And they use that water for crop irrigation. So overall, it's a very energy efficient school. A few of the other items that were interesting about the school is that when it was initially built because of the location, they included radon monitors. They went ahead because it was state of the art. They wanted to be mindful of indoor air quality issues. They actually had carbon dioxide sensors built into the school. And another thing, of course, with a lot of modern schools, they were able to control the temperature and relative humidity controls, which was, you know, for us, we're thinking, how do you have an indoor air quality issue? And so it really did raise the question for my colleague and I, what do we do? They've already experienced several different um, industrial hygienists coming in and doing IAQ studies. They come back with positive results saying everything is fine, yet these teachers are complaining of the same issues. So I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't provide a little literature review. If you look at the literature that's available on indoor air quality issues on the primary and secondary level of education, you will see that there's a huge gap. There's a large gap in identifying, tracking, and remediating environmental health threats in schools. We know what we know, but we really don't know what we don't know. And unlike a lot of other places like work, you can choose to not work in a particular building, kids have to go to school, at least from K through 12. And because we have a lot of little bodies in small rooms and there's more bodies these days, you know, sometimes up to 30 students in a classroom, you have high occupant densities that are basically setting us up for more issues with IQ. So um, higher levels of CO2, you know, higher levels of CO, you will see those rise as we have more bodies in these rooms. You also set yourself up for other health issues. Think about passing communicable diseases, um, you know, like influenza through a school it's going to go quickly because of how many people you're putting in such a small space. One of the things that we do look at though is these days, unlike when I was going to grade school, you know, most of, of the air exchange is me mechanically ventilated. When I went to school, we had windows, we opened them and we had natural ventilation, but most schools these days, they go away from that. So you 
kind of put all of your faith into this system and if it's not working properly, you start to see IQ issues, indoor air quality issues. So some of the things we have to think about when we're going in to do an indoor air quality study are the different attributes of the pollutants that are going to affect a person's well-being. And a lot of times we think about gases, we think about particulate matter, but we also have to think about some of those comfort parameters. Think about air temperature. If you are uncomfortable, you are probably not going to perform at your optimal level. That's going to be the same thing for students. They're not going to academically perform well if they're not comfortable. Think about humidity. If it's too low, we're going to have issues, but if it's too high, uh, we're also going to have issues. It's kind of like thinking about Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's just right, and that's what we're looking for. The air velocity, what's the exchange rate? How quickly are we moving the air in and out of a room? And of course, odors. And as you can imagine, teaching um, high school students that are working with animals on the farm, because remember, this is an agricultural high school. They've got livestock. They also have a veterinarian tech program, so they have dogs and cats and other domestic pets, it's going to smell. And so all of these different things combined with those traditional pollutants that we think about, like gases and particulate matter, can affect a person's well-being if the indoor air quality is poor. Um, I want to go through nine different non-residential pollutant exposures that we have to be mindful of. Number one is elevated bioeffluent levels associated with those high occupant densities and the inadequate ventilation. So bioeffluent, we mean pollutants that are released by humans and other organisms. We have emissions from office equipment. So things that we have to use to be more efficient in our job can actually cause us to have IQ issues cross-contamination from contaminant generating areas. So sometimes we have an area we think it's well ventilated, we have it blocked off where it shouldn't be an issue to other portions of a non-residential building, but for some reason we're able to cross-contaminate. Entrainments of uh, contaminants that are generated outdoors. So opening and closing doors, we pull in um, air from outside and that can actually bring outdoor pollutants in, creating an additional indoor air quality issue. We also have re-entry of building exhaust gases. So imagine that something is going wrong with your exhaust and you're actually pulling that gas um, back in through your um, intake and it's being basically circulated through your building. Contamination of air handling units by organisms and biological byproducts. And so you can think of like Legionnaire's disease, for example. Um, that would be an, a great example of an air handling unit having a problem and folks are wondering what is going on and something that should again help us, the air handling unit getting us the air exchange ends up hurting us. Transmission of contagious diseases such as flu, colds, and tuberculosis, um, especially flu, flu and colds when you think of the U.S. These are easily transmitted amongst these folks that are spending a good period of their day together. Exposure to resuspended surf, surface dust. So imagine, for example, you go in to sweep a room, you kick up the dust, that dust goes back into the air, you now have particulate matter that you could inhale. And then, of course, exposure to ETS where smoking is not restricted. So in a school, we're not going to have that issue. So uh, environmental tobacco smoke would not be an issue. But if you imagine if the school had a policy where they could smoke, you know, teachers could smoke somewhere on the premises, that could be an issue where it gets pulled back into the building. For this particular school, it's not because the county had a ban on public smoking. So other issues, ma uh, major indoor air pollutants that we'd have to be mindful of, asbestos, uh, of course, in older buildings, we know it was used for fireproofing, acoustical plaster, thermal system insulation. Um, we did not have that issue with this particular building because it was built in 2011. Radon. This is an issue because of where it's located and the topography and the different soil structure underneath the school. This region is known for high levels of radon. But remember, we have a radon detection system that's built into the school. Combustion byproducts, CO and CO2. So this particular school, as I mentioned, um, they actually do diesel engine repair. So they work on um, different farm equipment that have diesel engines. And as you'll find out through this presentation, the school didn't have the best ventilation system to account for running these diesel engines indoors. Aldehydes, especially formaldehyde. So if you think about newer buildings, most likely we're going to have 
a lot of compressed wood. We're going to have um, carpet and other materials that are going to have aldehydes in it, especially formaldehyde, because it's widely used in industrial and commercial chemicals. So we'll find it in pressed wood materials, especially particle board, so cabinetry and furniture. Um, if you got it for a good deal, there's a good chance you're going to see the off-gassing of these formaldehydes. We also have VOCs. Our, our um, VOCs are going to be common in this type of school because of the diesel engines and some of the other agricultural processes that they have. So volatile organic compounds, they can be emitted um, from a lot of different sources, but again for this one it's going to be from the equipment that they're using. All right, and of course mold. Um, any place where you can have some moisture going on in the perfect conditions, those microorganisms will grow and grow and grow as long as they have all of the perfect conditions, all the pieces of the puzzle to help them thrive. And in Kentucky, if you're not familiar, Kentucky has a huge mold pro uh, problem. So this was something we had to be mindful of as we were thinking through the potential pollutants for this school. Now, if you look at the research on contaminants in school, it's all of the usual suspects. Um, but one of the things you'll find is there's not a lot of good studies in the United States. Most of them happen um, abroad. So in Portugal, for example, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, and formaldehyde were above reference levels in these Portuguese schools, and they exceeded the World Health Organization's guidelines. In Canada, if you read certain literature, you'll see that uh, this particular study, 11 out of 65 schools that they studied had at least one radon measurement above Canadian federal guidelines. In Italy, uh, we've seen high concentrations of terpenes. In the US and also in Serbia, as we would expect with a high um, density occupancy type situation, we had high concentrations of CO2. Also in Portugal, in a different study, we saw culturable bacteria above guidelines. So these findings are not surprising given what we know about indoor quality issues. In a study where eight schools were examined in South Korea, researchers looked at airborne mold and smaller fungal particles. And their concern is that that submicron particle can go deeper into the lung, which is something that we commonly accept. The study found that airborne mold and bacteria and submicron fungal fragments actually went down by 35 to 55% after the rainy season. Okay, this is not earth shattering news. It's kind of like Kentucky. We know what type of, uh, what time of year we're going to see higher um, fungal growth, right? We just so happen to be doing our study in January. So it's very cold in Kentucky. We get a little snow, temperatures are in the 30s and 40s. So we don't see as much issue with the fungal growth, but we do see a lot of issue with folks passing on colds and influenza. So what do we take away from th this particular study? It tells us that good IAQ is a moving target and the methods to handle it must be adjusted seasonally. So we have to control for the season, the temperature, what's going on with the weather when we start looking at the potential IAQ issues. A few more studies before we move on to this particular study in the Midwestern portion of the United States. Poor indoor air quality is highly correlated with asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Again, not earth shattering, but it, it's something we have to point out because we have a lot of students that are going to be um, suffering from asthma and other respiratory illnesses. So they're more susceptible to these indoor air quality issues. Um, poor subjective IAQ is associated with school related stress and poor teacher student relationship. So basically what we're seeing here is if the IAQ goes down, even in perception, we're going to see more strain between the teachers and students, which is going to impact the ability of the teacher to instruct at his or her optimal level, but it's also going to impact the student's ability to take in that information and learn. Um, good student perception of IAQ is associated with decreased teacher sick leave. So when, te when students found the indoor quality to be agreeable to them, we noticed in literature that teachers were less likely to miss. They were more likely to be there, to be engaged, and to be instructing. Another thing that's interesting is schools with larger maintenance backlogs and smaller janitorial staff usually show lower academic performance. This is something to think about in a very budget oriented world that we live in. Sometimes school administrators think of the maintenance budget as soft money, that they can get rid of it without really affecting their academic performance. 
However, the negative health effects for students and teachers demonstrate that you must maintain good indoor air quality. It's core to the academic success of a school, and it's also core in building those relationships between teachers and their students. So that's a little background. We talked about a few indoor air quality pollutants. We looked at some of the literature. So now we're going to go through what my colleague and I did for our particular case. Recall that we're dealing with an agricultural school. It's a net zero energy facility. It's a magnet school, so the students aren't there all day, but the teachers are. So we decided, of course, to use the EPA NIOSH IAQ protocol. It's standard. I think it's marvelous because it keeps it straightforward, and you can kind of work yourself back through it when you think you have the answer, but the data aren't supporting it. So if you look at this figure, figure one, you start with your reason for concern. So our reason for concern was that the teachers were complaining about headaches, um, coughing, kind of cold symptoms, could be allergy symptoms, and they had gone through several IAQs in the past. Several IAQ studies have been conducted. The industrial hygienist would come back and say, there's not an issue, everything's coming back under the appropriate parameters. So what we did was we started off with a meeting with all the faculty, the staff, and the principal of the school. We wanted to tell them what we were about to do in the school. Full disclosure, we wanted to be transparent. We wanted to get that buy-in from them from the get-go, which is very important. We all know that's like um, management 101, right? Stakeholder buy-in. So we go to the school, we tell them what we're gonna do. We tell them the type of instruments we're gonna use, our time frame. Um, we give them our contact information so that if they do have questions that they could follow up with us. We also tell them that during our IAQ study, we were going to encourage them to complete a self-perception questionnaire. It's an indoor environmental quality survey where they get to tell us what type of symptoms they're experiencing. Do those symptoms get better when they leave school? Um, they get to tell us about their work day, their workstations, and then there's also just some open response questions where they can tell us any type of information they think is pertinent to the study. So we give them this information, everyone seems good to roll, and so we then go through and do our initial walkthrough. Um, so for us, we identified where the HVAC um, intakes and, and outlets were. We, we figured out all the major classrooms of the, the teachers that were having the biggest issues with symptoms. Um, we looked basically throughout the school for fungal growth. We looked at throughout the school for any issue that could be causing indoor air quality problems. So we do our visual inspection. Um, we also do some interviews with the occupants. So we do interviews with the teachers and we do interviews with the staff. So the front office staff, the principal. And so then we start thinking through obviously, do we have any explanation for the complaint? And so for us, we had to align that also with doing um, some monitoring. So we're gonna go back to this particular figure later in the presentation. I just wanted to get you started out where we were at. So our hypothesis basically was that based on what they were telling us, we probably had high CO2 levels, but of course we had to do monitoring. We wanted to make sure that we had additional information on the potential pollutant sources, the pathways from the source to the inhabitants. All right, so our methodology, we did the visual survey. So, of course, like I said, we did um, a look for visible signs of past or present water damage. We looked for visible fungal growth, and we looked for possible points of water and pollutant intrusion, right? And, of course, we left the survey in the boxes of all the faculty and staff in the front office for them to pick up and then drop off in the library. We wanted to do the library because we felt like that gave the faculty a little more control over who saw them you know, turning in their survey, just in case only a few people completed it. We did do radon sampling. Because the school had a built-in radon system, and of course, this particular area of the country has issues with radon, we wanted to go ahead and do um, a charcoal canister sampling. We built our plan. We based it off of pretty standard EPA school guidelines for um, assessing radon. We also did comfort parameter sampling. So we used a, um, several VelociCalcs, the 955P multifunction ventilation meter. And if you're familiar with it, the VelociCalc is capable of reading carbon dioxide and PPM, or parts per million, carbon monoxide in parts per million, relative humidity in percent, and then temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. 
So we had five of these that were set up throughout the school. And what we would do is rotate them by day so that we would ensure we got the hallway, we got classrooms, labs, offices, a full study of the school in terms of these comfort parameters. As I mentioned, students don't stay all day at the school. So this is just um, kind of a breakdown on the days we did it. Remember it was in January. We had roughly between 130 to 143 students at any given time in the morning in the classrooms. And in the afternoon, the number grew a little between 166 and 173. So it wasn't um, a huge student population, but they tended to be in certain classrooms at particular times during the day. This was the weather during our studies. So we did the IAQ comfort parameter testing the 9th through the 13th. And then we also did the radon for an extended period of time over the weekend while they were shut down in um, observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And you can just see this, you know, the temperature range, you know, it started out pretty bitterly cold, but then by the end of our study, it was getting higher during the day, which is a typical Kentucky um, weather day. If you don't like it, just give it a couple hours. It'll change, I promise. And you can see the precipitation there. So towards the end of the study, we did have more precipitation that was falling in the area. So coming back to this, we, we do our study. I want to give you some of the data that we were using to you know, either support or go against our hypothesis. So some of the visual observations that we made. So as we were walking through, we noticed in several places throughout the school, water damaged tile. Now this does not necessarily mean that we're gonna have fungal growth, but it does tell us that we have a water source that's uncontrolled, which could lead to fungal growth. This one was just, um, just so happened to be in the front office of the school. On the right, you'll see that we have leak residue. So something was coming from this pipe. We talked to maintenance. They weren't really sure what was going on. But this again told us that something is off here. Um, things are not being controlled. Maybe they could do a better job with their maintenance plan. Some of my favorite pictures. Um, if you look at the one on the left, you know, here we see in the diesel mechanics laboratory, we have just open containers, we have a spill on top, we have poor housekeeping. And what's very interesting is this particular lab belonged to one of the teachers that was the most vocal about the IQ issues. And many of the things could have been prevented through simple housekeeping. On the right, we did not confirm that this was mold growth. This was in a pitched ceiling that we were kind of thinking may be experiencing chimney effect. We just saw some sort of discoloration. It was very high off the ground. It was part of a follow-up study that we weren't contacted to do. Okay, um, on the left, you'll see that there's some repair happening to um, an engine. This was being done in a room that was not designed for um, this type of mechanical work. It was actually designed for horses. Because remember, this is a, uh, an agricultural school, and so they had an equine program, they had a veterinarian tech program. So this particular room was built for horses, and they had just basically turned it into a diesel mechanics room, but didn't change the ventilation. And so if you look on the right, you see a paint booth that clearly needs um, filter changing. Students were observed conducting grinding on a table outside of the paint booth. The paint booth was being used as the ventilation, which as we all know, provided minimal to no protection from the exposure to the contaminants that were associated, associated with their grinding activity. Um, the paint booth was also poorly located for a lot of the activities that took place in the laboratory. So many of the things they needed to paint could not get into the, the actual paint booth, which caused them to paint them in places that didn't provide adequate ventilation. Here you can see they've brought in some tractors on the left. The ventilation is actually dropped down from the ceiling, but that again was for horses. So it was not at the appropriate levels for the type of work they were doing. They just had the general ventilation you would have with the classroom, not for diesel mechanics. On the right, you can see the ventilation booths that they were using for certain types of welding. When we did um, just a quick study on the rate, everything was too low. There was no way that it was actually pulling in what it needed to to protect those students. Another thing we noticed, which is just like the safety person in me, all these things being stored on top of 
the actual booths, which is a big no-no. Some other visual observations that we saw. Um, the hallway led into each of the classrooms and labs through these little corridors. And as you can see, um, each of these corridors had windows that could not open, all right? And what was interesting is the hallway itself had no exchange. We could not find any um, inlets, outlets, anything like that associated with the hallway. And it essentially was supposed to be a temperature controlled area where they would maintain it at a certain temperature in winter and a certain temperature in summer. And for some reason, it would not stay in those parameters while we were there. You can see the pitched um, ceiling on the right. This is where we were seeing some chimney effect where the warm air would just rise up and kind of get captured there, causing the potential fungal growth. Another visual observation, no, I did not get to experience all these lovely puppies while I was there, but I did see several teachers that were bringing their personal pets to school. Now, mind you, it is a vet tech school in addition to the agricultural piece. So they had a whole section of the building where students were earning their vet tech certification. And so it's just natural that you would see animals there but the animals were brought into the vet tech area through an external door. So technically there was some control over where those animals would go in the building, which could minimize some of the biological issues that we would see, some of those biofluent um, indoor air quality issues. The teachers were taking them to their offices, classroom spaces, um, and just letting them kind of free range. So that was one of the things that we saw as a potential issue. Additional observations that we saw, the vents in the rooms were not operable by the teachers, so they really had little to no control over that. We noticed that in the chemistry lab, they didn't have vents. They didn't have hoods. They basically were doing chemical reactions in different chemistry uh, laboratory projects without any ventilation other than like your natural exchange you would get in the room. They had a chemical storage room that had zero ventilation, which was a huge red flag for me because as you can imagine, here you are storing all these different chemicals, um, and if you didn't put the ventilation in, that tells me that you might not be up, you know, up to par with the type of training you would want to have for a chemical safety officer. And then we had a lot of dehumidifiers in classrooms, labs, and offices, and what we saw was that the relative humidity was low in a lot of the rooms. So, of course, we would probably would see the itchy eyes, itchy throat associated with lower relative humidity. And so when we're looking at the comfort parameters, remember that's what we use VelociCalc to measure. We were able to measure temperature, relative humidity, and we were also able to obviously measure CO2 and CO. So this just gives you the standard. So for temperature, for example, where we wanna be by the ASHRAE standard 55 from 2010 is between 74 to 82 in the summer and 68 to 78 in the winter. So we were in the middle of winter for Kentucky, so we should have been between 68 and 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Relative humidity should be between 30 to 65, but if you're on that lower end and you're starting to experience issues, you may wanna bump it up a little just to have some humidity in the air because of thinking of the dry throats and, and some of the symptoms we were being told about from the teachers. If you look at the ventilation, looking at CO2, um, you know, about 700 parts per million over outdoor ambient concentrations is what we would want. So what were we actually finding? we were finding relative humidity levels that were well below 40 percent and of course we know when we see that in a school with a lot of folks a lot of young bodies coming in and out during the day um, you're going to have increased discomfort the longer they are in these classrooms and of course over time you can have drying of the mucous membranes you can have coughing itching sore throat and of course on the opposite end of that if we had areas of the building with high humidity we could see um, it being a perfect place for bacteria and fungi to grow. So most rooms were below the recommended relative humidity of 40%. As we said, 30 to 60% is desired. Several rooms and hallways were below the recommended comfort temperatures of 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Quite frankly, it was very uncomfortable the entire time that I was there and I had on a coat and a toboggan, which in Kentucky means a hat, just in case you don't know. Um, for radon, we did find three spaces that had action levels higher than four. And those spaces were in a caretaker's apartment that was associated with the barn. All right, so again, um, four picocuries per liter, that's gonna be our action um, level, and we had three spaces higher than that. 
our ambient concentrations of carbon dioxide were 300 to 400 parts per million. The indoor concentration was greater than 1,000 parts per million in some of the rooms at given points of the day. And so when we see that, we know that there's a possibility of inadequate ventilation and it can lead to complaints. So we're gonna see folks um, complaining with headaches, fatigue, eye and throat irritation. So in terms of the carbon dioxide levels, you can see um, these are the different spaces that we monitored. Each space was monitored all day long. So remember we have five different um, VelociCalcs going, we would rotate them each day. And so you can see that certain places we had peak levels like room 106, which was a classroom, went well above the thousand um, parts per million of CO2 and several others were peak, you know, peaking up above that. Um, if you look at the maximum carbon dioxide reading, so the slide before was looking at your average. If you look at maximum, so for 106, the one we saw that higher average, you'll see that it peaked out at 1,684, all right? Um, the building has an occupancy of less than 20 for approximately one hour after the morning sessions, which means that like after the students in the morning session leave, there's only about 20 people there. Um, and those are the teachers and that's the staff. And it still took um, probably a good hour or more for these numbers to come down. And what's unfortunate is by the time they start coming down, the afternoon session starts coming in. And so you're just gonna see those levels go back up and then stay at those higher levels for over an hour or more after the school day has ended. Now, so that was all the stuff that we monitored. Like I told you at the beginning, we did an indoor environmental quality survey so that we could let the teachers have a voice in this process. And so if you look at our survey, time worked in this building in years, five or more. So some of the folks had spent the good majority of the building's, I guess, duration of existence working in that building, okay? And they were the ones that essentially were the most vocal about their symptoms and associating it with indoor air quality. Time worked in the building this week and days. So the majority of them were going to be working all five days as you'd expect with the teachers. Some only worked three to four days. It was based on their contract. So if they weren't teaching agriculture and they were teaching um, subjects such as English, math, the different sciences, biology and chemistry, they may only be there a portion of the week or a portion of the day, depending on what they teach. Time worked in the building um, per week, this week and hours. So just in case you didn't know this already, teachers put a lot of time into your students. So the majority of them were there between 40 to 50 hours per week. So they're spending a good chunk of time at school. Time spent outside at work. Remember, this is an agricultural school. So we would expect that there would be a good percent of time spent outside dealing with the horses, cattle, and other pieces of the farm. So 26 to 50% of the time, 25% of the faculty were outside. 42% um, spent 0% of their time outside. Remember, we have that vet tech program. We have the traditional subjects being taught. This isn't surprising. Indoor environmental quality survey, their current workstation type, 33% um, were in a classroom. We had some that had a shared private office so they could be counselors, um, librarians, or media specialists, or front office workers. Um, and of course, there were some that were classroom lab combo where they would instruct the lecture in one room and move into the lab to do the hands-on. And then we had some other types of spaces such as the library and then classroom that's inside outside exposure. The cleanliness of the workstation, I thought this, I found this to be interesting. You know, they're complaining of IQ issues a lot of times. What are we seeing with IQ issues? We're seeing particulate matter from dust and other um, bioaffluents. But 67% of the participants said it was reasonably clean, that their workstation was reasonably clean. 17% said very clean and only 17% said it was somewhat dusty or dirty. The presence of carpet, which we know can harbor a lot of those um, particulates and a lot of bioaffluents. 83%, um, if you look at this, so it says presence of carpet on all or most of the workstation floor. 83% said no. Most of the floor was either stained concrete or tile. Very few places in the building had carpet. Survey takers who work with the computer, as we all would expect, 92% said yes. Um, some of the items that they've used in the last week, at least three times, 
clean, uh, cleansers, glues, correction fluids. Um, they've used a fax machine. Of course, it's an agricultural school, so they're using pesticides, interacting with animals and fertilizers. And then items that they use several times a day, of course, the vet tech program, the, the large animal ag piece of the school, they're 25% using animals, 67% using laser printers to print off materials for students. Um, looking at the survey, um, survey takers who consider themselves especially sensitive to. So we asked them for their own perception on their sensitivity. And so tobacco smoke, 50% said yes, they're especially sensitive to it. And then 42% said that they were especially sensitive to other chemicals in the air. So um, these are symptoms. So we asked each of the participants to tell us about the symptoms they've experienced every or almost every workday. And so as you can see, 33% had dry or itchy skin, 25% had unusual tiredness, fatigue or drowsiness, and then you see also stuffy runny nose at 25%, um, dry itching or irritated eyes at 17%. Two or more of those symptoms are experienced, uh, are things that you can experience that are, uh, are associated with low relative humidity, um, especially dry or itchy skin and dry, itchy or irritated eyes. But it also could be associated with just the weather and the given time and temperature in Kentucky. I mean, it's very common for colds and flus and, and just overall just not feeling well that time of year. Um, indoor air environmental quality survey, one to three days per week in the last four weeks. 50% of them said they had headaches, which again could be an IQ issue. Difficulty remember things are concentrating. Unusual tiredness, fatigue, or drowsiness. So 50% headaches, 42% had issues remembering things. 25%, if you look at their symptoms, tension, irritability, nervousness, sore, dry throat, sneezy, uh, stuffy runny nose. I mean, again, this could be cold. The tension, irritability, or nervousness could be associated with stress with work. So it's hard to say it was associated with IQ issues. Um, if you look at when they left the building, we said, okay, you leave the building, you go home for the weekend. Um, do your symptoms stay the same? So stuffy or runny nose or sinus congestion, 58% said yes, they stay the same. Difficulty remembering things are concentrating, 50% say yes, it stays the same. The sneezing stays the same, 50%. You, you kind of get the picture here. A good majority of them, were, or around a majority of them, were still experiencing these issues. Now, we did ask them to tell us if it got better. And so we had 58% that said the headaches did get better after a while, you know, after being away for a longer period of time. Unusual tiredness, fatigue, or drowsiness, again, 42% after being away for a while. So um, this, you can imagine, is like being away for a winter break, being away for summer break, okay? Um, environmental conditions. We asked them every or almost every day while they're at work if they experienced any of these things. And 58% said there was too little air movement. They felt like the air was too still, it was too dry. 42% um, felt it was too cold. And then we had 17% that thought it was um, unpleasant, that there was chemical odors in the atmosphere. And so these are some other ones where we allowed them just to open a response. Employees could write any aspects of the building environment or employee health that they felt appropriate. And then we reviewed these comments and tried to clump them together. And there wasn't a great response to this, but you can still see headaches, forgetfulness, cat allergies. Um, of course, that's important if you think about people bringing their personal pets, but also because of the vet tech program that they had at the school. One of the things I thought was interesting too, is you can see on the right about the building environment, um, lack of personnel that's trained on HVAC on evenings and weekends because there was no one there to take care of the system over the weekend. So what did we tell them? What was some of the follow-up that we suggested? First of all, we said, you need to do short-term radon measurements for your caretaker's apartment. We need to see if it was just a fluke as to why we had those levels above the action level, or is this something that is serious and we need to get a mitigation plan in place? We told them they should probably clean ceilings of any possible microbial growth above the windows. So think of that pitched ceiling that uh, ceilings that we looked at. Replace water damage ceiling tiles. You know, in those tiles we didn't see microbial growth. The ones that were a closer up picture that we could actually capture with our um, phones. But what we were thinking is you have uncontrolled um, water leakage. You could potentially have fungal growth. Remove personal dehumidifiers from offices, classrooms, and labs, because recall that the relative humidity was well under 40. So you can start seeing issues with dry uh, eyes and throats and that sort of thing. 
keeping the areas in front of the CO2, CO2 sensors clear. So in many of the classrooms, we observe that their CO2 sensors, which are built into the system, it's so amazing that they have them, were actually being blocked. So the sensor couldn't actually do its job. The other piece was they admittedly told us the CO2 sensors were out of calibration. So the data that were being pulled and being sent to the central office for the school district could not be interpre interpreted um, appropriately because all the sensors weren't calibrated and the person who knew how to calibrate, it, calibrate them um, had actually retired. And then of course, improve housekeeping and minimize pet dander. Um, other short-term recommendations, you know, um, replace the paint booth filters, contact, contact the paint booth manufacturer to determine the optimal operating pressure to ensure that they're protecting those students who are learning a skill to one day work in the field. Develop a preventative maintenance plan so that that type of filter disregard wouldn't happen again in the future. And just putting it on a schedule so someone knows to change the filters after a good um, percentage used. And then sampling for VOCs and welding fumes, because we just did not think that um, the ventilation they did have was appropriate. One of the other items that we told them that we thought would be a good thing for them was forming an IAQ team. And I know what you're thinking, how many schools have you ever heard of that's had an indoor air quality coordinator? But with a school that's had so much history of IAQ complaints, this is a great opportunity to put someone in charge, to put a face, um, out there for folks to bring their issues to so they can be resolved. We also gave them, of course, the age old, tried, tested, and you know, proven to work EPA guidance on school IAQ, which causes them to do some of the thing, same things we looked at, the HVAC, looking for moisture or mold, thinking about their integrated pest management so they have less of those biofluent issues, um, cleaning and maintenance schedules, the materials they're bringing into the building, the sources of some of their issues, which were in their classrooms, they could have closed things off, capped things off, and then also their energy efficiency, All right? Um, I wanna go through two last slides before we end, just so I can end on time and give you guys um, a little time to ask questions. When we think about IQ management, exclusion obviously is where we wanna go, right? Exclusion, we wanna avoid the use of contaminant emitting products when we can, but I came from industry and I know that a lot of times, you know, the product is cheaper, but it has the things in it that we don't want to come in contact with. And we kind of do this um, cost and effect, right? We weigh it out. I also know that sometimes it just depends on what you're budgeted, right? What, if you think of a school district, they have a very finite budget and a lot of things that they need to actually um, provide money to. So they may not be able to do that. Switch to a low emitting product. So if you can't avoid the use of that contaminant emitting product, get a low emitting product. Source removal, you know, take the source out if you can. You can also source treat. So if you know that your furniture, for example, is going to have issues with formaldehyde, is there something you can purchase to encapsulate it, some sort of treatment? Ventilation, look for infiltration and exfiltration of your building. Where are things coming in and going out where they should not be? right? Find a way to seal those. And then thinking about natural. So natural ventilation would, be, would have been good for some of those rooms um, had they had more control over their windows. Um, but with natural ventilation, we know comes other issues because then you have all those ambient air quality issues, those ambient air pollutants that could then come into that indoor space. So it's a trade-off. And then mechanical. So thinking about the general dilution of the building. So take, for example, the hallways in the school didn't have ventilation. Also think about local exhaust ventilation. Why have it if it's not going to do the job? And then the last slide is just thinking about addressing risk from an IQ um, standpoint, almost like a hierarchy of control. So five different ways I found in a very good study. Um, type one is just raising awareness. So when you go in to do an IQ study, educating folks on hygiene, what's appropriate with chemical use, what's appropriate storage use, what's material handling look like for them. Um, talk to them about the characteristics of their cleaning products. Go over the safety data sheets with them. They may not even know what a safety data sheet is. Sheet is. They should, right, because of Hascom, but maybe they don't. Maybe they just kind of browse through the training that day. Thinking about changing behaviors, right? Um, so getting folks to improve their cleaning actions. So cleaning more to reduce particulates in the air, um, but then also thinking about 
the products and materials and the places of activities, right? The type three uh, way of addressing air quality. Type three, um, we could use a vacuum instead of a broom. So the vacuum is actually capturing the dust and the broom is just knocking it into the air, resuspending it for you to breathe in. Use different rooms based on the type of activity to be carried out. Point in case, don't do diesel mechanics in a room that was built for um, equine type work, working with horses. And if you are, you need to think about the ventilation, right? You may have to change that. So type four, make technical and technological changes, right? Put in the type of ventilation you need for that room. Uh, type five examples, this is structural changes. So instead of using chalkboards, use whiteboards. Instead of using whiteboards, use the overhead projector with the monitor and, and take out you know, markers and take out um, chalk. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. This is my contact information. Again, I'm Clint Pinion um, and I work at Eastern Kentucky University. And anytime you wanna drop a line, I would be happy to receive your emails at clint.pinion at eku.edu. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Um, at this time, we do have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So please feel free to enter any questions that you might have into the Q&A box, and I'm happy to read them aloud. Um, our first question, someone was wondering if the teachers and staff were asked about time factors, like what time of day, where, and when they experienced issues with the indoor air quality. So we did ask them and we met with a lot of the teachers like one on one. I wouldn't call it like um, interviews, if you will, like we would think about in the academic world, but we did meet with them kind of informally. And what they told us was as the day progressed, um, especially in classrooms where they've been teaching all day, that's where they would start to experience the headaches, the fatigue. Um, so we did ask them, but we did not ask them with a the survey. That would have been something that would have boosted the survey. The other thing is, of course, like with the diesel mechanics, as the day went on, that particular teacher noticed more headaches. But again, he had been working with his students around all those different chemicals and oils and fuels and whatnot throughout the day. So usually towards the end of the day, which is what we would expect, especially with comfort parameters with CO2 and CO and the temperature issues, we would expect that as there's been a lot of bodies in and out of those classrooms and labs. Thank you. We also have another question about if these recommendations were implemented and were you able to note improvement? That's a great question. So, of course, with this being a consulting type approach, we gave them short term, long term recommendations. And then, of course, we told them we could do a follow up and help them implement. We were not contacted back. I think it may have gone back to that over time they'd had so many IQ issues. They felt like many of the things were easily addressed with our short-term recommendations and they didn't follow up with us. We did contact them, um, I think it was actually earlier this year and they didn't have any updates to provide. Great, thank you. Um, and if there were any previous consultant reports, were you given the option to review those? We actually were. We were fortunate enough to see the past work. So we had Excel sheets that included the data of any of the monitoring that had been done. So if you think about the radon and comfort parameters, we could see past studies that had been done at the site. And so in the past, it was kind of what we were seeing. You would see peaks with CO2 and CO at certain points of the day. They did have some early on issues with radon, but that was corrected. Again, they had a radon monitoring system, which helped them stay on top of that. And of course, the school could use their ventilation to their advantage to um, bring down radon levels. Great, thank you. Um, regarding compliance and relevant standards involved with indoor air quality, um, this person has a question about OSHA. So assume OSHA would have jurisdiction over the building as the faculty and staff are employed at the school. However, are there any other regulating bodies that ensure safety standards are met for the sake of the children at the school? Yes, so one of the things that comes into play, because you have to think about local municipalities, um, health department can come into play. And, and quite frankly, um, I've given an IAQ presentation um, at one of my local environmental health association conferences, and it, come up, it came up again and again and again because the health department's environmentalists get called out to the schools because of the endangerment of the children. Like, it gets brought up, oh, my, my student says that they're having headaches while at school, they're, they can't focus, so the health department gets called. And so then the health department has to go out and they have to do their own investigation 
many times they aren't exactly trained in IAQ issues. Um, a lot of their work is geared more toward sanitation, dealing with like water, wastewater, food issues. Um, and then if you think of their air quality piece, they do a lot with like EPA's implementation of, um, you know, the ambient air quality ambient air quality standards. So they came into play. So that was one of the, the only other agency that we had information that had been out to do um, a study. Excellent, thank you. And how do you go about IAQ assessments where an industrial hygienist, for example, has no idea on what's occurring, one that may seem like an unsolvable puzzle? Well, you, if, you, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll go back to my slide. Um, Sorry, folks, look away from the screen if it's going to cause you uh, any <laughs> issues. Um, but going back to this, this, this diagram, this flow chart, it's really good because you make your assumptions based on the data you have. You test that assumption. If it didn't give you the, um, you know, basically the outcome you expected, you go back through the process and try to figure out where do I need to get data from? With whom do I need to speak, you know, to figure out how I get HVAC system diagrams? How do I get um, access to the school at different periods of the day? How do I get access to the inhabitants of the building? You, so it really is um, most of the time trial and error. I don't think anyone goes in knowing exactly what an issue is, but over time, if you see the same type of issues from similar buildings, there may be some commonalities, but I think each building is its own beast and you have to take this diagram and, and your own approach as a professional and go back through and, and just adjust based on what you find. Great, thank you. And would you recommend an IAQ coordinator to all school districts and how do you foresee that taking place? Of course I would. I mean, um, as an environmental occupational health person, I think having someone at the school that is the face of indoor air quality issues would be a great thing to have. But I'm realistic in the approach that most schools, because they are so busy. I mean, if you think about what we put on our teachers across the nation, we put the, you know, the education of our young folks in their hands and they have to take care of that. Plus all that comes along with it, right? All of those interpersonal issues. I doubt that IAQ is gonna rank high on their list. And so I would love to see it, but I just don't think that you could require it, right? You could recommend it, which is, of course, what is recommended by the EPA, but it would be so difficult to roll out. I mean, it would almost have to be a mandate from, from um, like the State Board of Education, which I doubt would happen just with all the issues they have to deal with each day. Thank you. Um, and in these types of projects, is there you, any resistance from the client or from other groups of people regarding the data or the solutions that you come to? Oh, of course. Um, I think when you have folks who feel there's an issue and you present the data to them and say, this is what the data are saying, and it doesn't really turn out how they had anticipated, there's backlash. I mean, that's human nature. If you had it in your mind that something was going to be there when you get the data back and it wasn't, then you're going to be upset. And then there's the opposite end of that. If you were the folks calling us in so that you could appease someone, right? Because sometimes IAQ issues it's also showing, like when we see the data, it helps us calm down a little that, okay, we're in comfort parameters. We're, you know, we're, we're okay on these numbers. Um, they may not want to know that, yes, we did find things above action levels, or yes, we did see things that could be an issue for them. But you give them the data, you give them the facts in your report, you go over it with them to educate them, and then it's really on them to decide how they handle it from that point moving forward. You can't make them do what they need to do. You are just a consultant giving your opinion based on your professional experience. Thank you. Um, we also have another um, comment slash question. Um, ASHRAE reduced the CO2 guidance level from 700 parts per million above outdoor air by making it a flat 1,000 parts per million. I find complaints occurring around 800 parts per million and sometimes even lower. What is your opinion of these numbers in predicting occupant discomfort? Well, um, I also find what you're finding, so I agree with you. I think it also depends, you know, from situation to situation. I think each person is so different, and I'm talking about the people experiencing the IAQ issues. So sensitivity, just in general, to IAQ issues will make a difference. I think, honestly, that a lower number is probably going to be more representative of what's going on, just because, um, 
the higher we get, it almost kind of discounts what that person is feeling, if that makes sense. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are coming to the close of our time here, but I did want to ask just one last question. Um, in your experience, you've mentioned budget a couple of times in terms of maintenance budget being considered discretionary um, or the allocation of resources to lower emission product substitutions and etc. Um, are you able to provide, I guess, any, any advice as to someone how they can communicate with, with a client about the benefits of allocating budget towards indoor air quality? Of course, I think it goes with any EHS issue. If you think environmental occupational health, our job a lot of times, especially in industry, is to show the benefit of, of making that change. And so a lot of times when you look at how can we allocate money from the budget, you wanna look at how can I sell this to the person who has control of the money? What's gonna be the benefit to that school district, for example, if we implement these IQ changes? And that's what it comes down to. I mean. Budgets, there's folks who are budget oriented, there's folks that are budget oriented plus health oriented, and you kind of just have to come to the table and decide like what can we do and how can we make this sellable. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, as a reminder to our attendees, this presentation has been recorded and will be made available. Um, and the special thank you to Dr. Pinion and as well as to everyone who has joined us online. The NIOSH Education and Research Center Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series will take place the second Tuesday of every month. This new series is in addition to our NIOSH ERC Ergonomics Webinar Series, which takes place the third Wednesday of each month. Our next industrial hygiene themed webinar will be on June 9th with Dr. Elizabeth Knopf and Dr. Kathy Hammond on exposure assessment for epidemiology research, use of routine industrial monitoring data. Be sure to check out our website for more information and to register for upcoming events at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Thank you again all so much for joining us today and I hope you have an excellent rest of your Tuesday.